Hello, hello, my friends, and welcome back for another chapter of Suzanne Collins's novel, Mockingjay. Today, we're on chapter 14. District 2 is a large district, as one might expect, composed of a series of villages spread across the mountains. Each was originally associated with a mine or quarry, although now many are devoted to the housing and training of peacekeepers. None of this would present much of a challenge since the rebels have 13's air power on their side, except for one thing. At the center of the district is a virtually impenetrable mountain that houses the heart of the capital's military. We've nicknamed the mountain the Nut since I relayed Plutarch's tough nut to crack comment to the weary and discouraged rebel leaders here. The nut was established directly after the dark days, when the capital had lost 13 and was desperate for a new underground stronghold. They had some of the military resources situated on the outskirts of the capital itself, nuclear missiles, aircrafts, troops, but a significant chunk of their power was now under an enemy's control. Of course, there was no way they could hope to replicate 13, which was the work of centuries. However, in the old mines of nearby District 2, they saw opportunity. From the air, the nut appears to be just another mountain with a few entrances on its faces. But inside were vast cavernous spaces where slabs of stone had been cut, hauled to the surface, and transported down slippery narrow roads to make distant buildings. There was even a train system to facilitate transporting the miners from the nut to the very center of the main town in District 2. It ran right to the square that Peta and I visited during the victory tour. Standing on the wide marble steps of the Justice Building, trying not to look too closely at Cato's and Clove's grieving families assembled below us. It was not the most ideal terrain, plagued as it was by mudslides, floods, and avalanches, but the advantages outweighed the concerns. As they cut deep into the mountain, the miners had left large pillars and walls of stone to support the infrastructure. The capital reinforced these and set about making the mountain their new military base. Filling it with computer banks and meeting rooms, barracks and arsenals, widening entrances to allow the exit of hovercraft from the hangar, installing missile launchers. But on the whole, leaving the exterior of the mountain largely unchanged. A rough, rocky tangle of trees and wildlife, a natural fortress to protect them from their enemies. By the other district standards, the capital babied the inhabitants here. Just by looking at the District 2 rebels, you can see that they were decently fed and cared for in childhood. Some did end up in quarry and mine workers. Others were educated for jobs in the nut or funneled into the ranks of peacekeepers, trained young and hard for combat. The Hunger Games were an opportunity for wealth and a kind of glory not seen elsewhere. Of course, the people of two swallowed the capital's propaganda more easily than the rest of us, embraced their ways. But for all that, at the end of the day, they were still slaves. And if that was lost on the citizens who became peacekeepers or worked in the nut, it was not lost on the stonecutters who formed the backbone of the resistance here. Things stand as they did when I arrived two weeks ago. The outer villages are in rebel hands, the town divided, and the nut is as untouchable as ever. Its few entrances heavily fortified, its heart safely enfolded in the mountain. While every other district has now wrested control from the capital, two remains in its pocket. Each day, I do whatever I can to help. Visit the wounded, tape short propos with my camera crew, I'm not allowed in actual combat, but they invite me to the meetings on the status of the war, which is a lot more than they did in 13. It's much better here. It's freer. No schedules on my arm, fewer demands on my time. I live above ground in the rebel villages or surrounding caves. 
For safety's sake, I'm relocated often. During the day, I've been given clearance to hunt as long as I take a guard along and don't stray too far. In the thin, cold mountain air, I feel some physical strength returning, my mind clearing away the rest of the fogginess. But with this mental clarity comes an even sharper awareness of what has been done to Peta. Snow has stolen him from me, twisted him beyond recognition, and made me a present of him. Boggs, who came to two when I did, told me that even with all the plotting, it was a little too easy to rescue Peta. He believes if Thirteen hadn't made the effort, Peta would have been delivered to me anyway, dropped off in an actively warring district, or perhaps Thirteen itself tied up with ribbons and tagged with my name, programmed to murder me. It's only now that he's been corrupted. It's only now that he's been corrupted that I can fully appreciate the real PETA, even more than I would have if he had died. The kindness, the steadiness, the warmth that had an unexpected heat behind it. Outside of Prim, my mother, and Gail, how many people in the world love me unconditionally? I think, in my case, the answer may now be none. Sometimes, when I'm alone, I take the pearl from where it lives in my pocket and try to remember the boy with the bread, the strong arms that warded off nightmares on the train, the kisses in the arena, to make myself put a name to the thing I've lost. But what's the use? It's gone. He's gone. Whatever existed between us is gone. All that's left is my promise to kill Snow. I tell myself this ten times a day. Back in 13, Peta's rehabilitation continues. Even though I don't ask... Bluedark gives me cheerful updates on the phone, like, Good news, Katniss. I think we've almost got him convinced you're not a mutt. Or, Today he was allowed to feed himself pudding. When Hamish gets on after, he admits Peter's no better. The only dubious ray of hope has come from my sister. Prim came up with the idea of trying to hijack him back, Hamish tells me bring up the distorted memories of you and then give him a big dose of a calming drug, like morphling. We've only tried it on one memory, the tape of the two of you in the cave when you told him that story about getting Prim the goat. Any improvement, I ask? Well, if extreme confusion is an improvement over extreme terror, then yes, says Hamish. But I'm not sure it is. He lost the ability to speak for several afters, went into some sort of stupor. When he came out, the only thing he asked about was the goat. Right, I say. How's it out there, he asks me. No forward motion, I tell him. We're sending out a team to help with the mountain. Beatty and some of the others, he says. You know, the brains. When the brains are selected, I'm not surprised to see Gail's name on the list. I thought Beatty would bring him, not for his technological expertise, but in the hopes that he could think of some way to ensnare a mountain. Originally, Gail offered to come with me to two, but I could see I was tearing him away from his work with Beatty. I told him to sit tight and stay where he was most needed. I didn't tell him his presence would make it even more difficult for me to mourn Peter. Gail finds me when they arrive late one afternoon. I'm sitting on a log at the edge of my current village, plucking a goose. A dozen or so of the birds are piled at my feet. Great flocks of them have been migrating through here since I've arrived, and the pickings are easy. 
Without a word, Gale settles behind me and begins to relieve a bird of its feathers. We're through about half when he says, Any chance we'll get to eat these? Yeah. Most go to the camp kitchen, but they expect me to give a couple to whoever I'm staying with tonight, I say, for keeping me. Isn't the honor of the thing enough, he says. You'd think, I reply, but word's gotten out that mocking jays are hazardous to your health. We pluck in silence for a while longer. Then, he says, I saw Petey yesterday. Through the glass. What'd you think? I ask. Something selfish, says Gail. That you don't have to be jealous of him anymore? My fingers give a yank, and a cloud of feathers float down around us. No. Just the opposite. Gail pulls a feather out of my hair. I thought. I'll never compete with that. No matter how much pain I'm in. He spins the feather between his thumb and forefinger. I don't stand a chance if he doesn't get better. You'll never be able to let him go. You'll always feel wrong about being with me. The way I always felt wrong kissing him because of you, I say. Gale holds my gaze. If I thought that was true, I could almost live with the rest of it. It is true, I admit. But so is what you said about Peta. Gale makes a sound of exasperation. Nonetheless, after we've dropped off the birds and volunteered to go back to the woods to gather kindling for the evening fire, I find myself wrapped in his arms his lips brushing the faded bruises on my neck, working their way to my mouth. Despite what I feel for Peta, this is when I accept, deep down, that he'll never come back to me. Or I'll never go back to him. I'll stay in two until it falls, go to the capital and kill Snow, and then die for my trouble. And then he'll die insane and hating me. So in the fading light, I shut my eyes and kiss Gail to make up for all the kisses I've withheld. And because it doesn't matter anymore, and because I'm so desperately lonely, I can't stand it. Gail's touch and taste and heat remind me that at least my body's still alive. And for the moment, it's a welcome feeling. I empty my mind and let the sensations run through my flesh, happy to lose myself. When Gail pulls away slightly, I move forward to close the gap, but I feel his hand under my chin. Katniss, he says. The moment I open my eyes, the world seems disjointed. This is not our woods, or our mountains, or our way. My hand automatically goes to the scar on my left temple, which I associate with confusion. Now kiss me. Bewildered, unblinking, I stand there, while he leans in and presses his lips to mine, briefly. He examines my face closely. What's going on in your head? I don't know, I whisper back. Then it's like kissing someone who's drunk. It doesn't count, he says, with a weak attempt at a laugh. He scoops up a pile of kindling and drops it in my empty arms, returning me to myself. How do you know, I say, mostly to cover my embarrassment. Have you kissed someone who's drunk? I guess Gail could have been kissing girls left and right back in 12. He certainly had enough takers. I never thought about it much before. He just shakes his head. No, but it's not hard to imagine. So you never kissed any other girls, I ask? I didn't say that. You know, you were only 12 when we met. And a real pain, besides. I did have a life outside of hunting with you, he says, loading up with firewood. Suddenly, I'm genuinely curious. Who did you kiss? And where? Too many to remember. Behind the school, on the slag heap, you name it, he says. I roll my eyes. So when did I become so special? When they carted me off to the capital? 
No. About six months before that. Right after New Year's. We were in the hob, eating some slop of greasy says, and Darius was teasing you about trading a rabbit for one of his kisses. And I realized... I minded, he tells me. I remember that day. Bitter cold and dark by four in the afternoon. We had been hunting, but a heavy snow had driven us back into town. The hob was crowded with people looking for refuge from the weather. Greasy Say's soup, made with stock from the bones of a wild dog we'd shot a week earlier, was below her usual standards. Still, it was hot, and I was starving as I scooped it up, sitting cross-legged on her counter. Darius was leaning on the post of the stall, tickling my cheek with the end of my braid while I smacked his hand away. He was explaining why one of his kisses merited a rabbit, or possibly two, since everyone knows the red-headed men are the most virile. And Greasy Say and I were laughing because he was so ridiculous and persistent and kept pointing out women around the hob who he said had paid far more than a rabbit to enjoy his lips. See, the one in the green muffler, go ahead and ask her, if you need a reference. A million miles from here, a billion days ago, this happened. Darius was just joking around, I say. Probably. Although you'd be the last to figure it out if he wasn't, Gail tells me. Take Peta. Take me. Or even Finnick. I was starting to worry he had his eye on you, but he seems back on track now. You don't know Finnick if you think he'd love me, I say. Gail shrugs. I know he was desperate. That makes people do all kinds of crazy things. I can't help but thinking that's directed at me. Bright and early the next day, the brains assemble to take on the problem of the nut. I'm asked to the meeting, although I don't have much to contribute. I avoid the conference table and perch in the wide windowsill that has a view of the mountain in question. The commander from 12, a middle-aged woman named Lime, takes us on a virtual tour of the nut, its interior and fortifications, and recounts the failed attempts to seize it. I've crossed paths with her briefly a couple of times since my arrival and was dogged by the feeling I'd met her before. She's memorable enough, standing over six feet tall and heavily muscled. But it's only when I see a clip of her in the field leading a raid on the main entrance of the nut that something's click and I realize I'm in the presence of another victor. Lime, the tribute from District 2 who won her Hunger Games over a generation ago. Effie sent us her tape, among others, to prepare for the quarter quell. I've probably caught glimpses of her during the games over the years, but she's kept a low profile. With my newfound knowledge of Haymitch's and Finnick's treatment, all I can think is, what did the Capitol do to her after she won? When Lyme finishes the presentation, the questions from the brains begin. Hours pass, and lunch comes and goes as they try to come up with a realistic attack for taking the nut. But while BT thinks he might be able to override certain computer systems, and there's some discussion of putting the handful of internal spies to use, no one has any really innovative thoughts. As the afternoon wears on, talk keeps returning to a strategy that has been tried repeatedly, the storming of the entrances. I can see Lime's frustration building because so many variations of this plan have already failed. So many of her soldiers have been lost. Finally, she bursts out, the next person who suggests we take the entrances better have a brilliant way to do it because you're going to be the one leading that mission. Gail, who is too restless to sit at the table for more than a few hours, has been alternating between pacing and sharing my windowsill. Early on, he seemed to accept Lime's assertion that the entrances couldn't be taken and dropped out of the conversation entirely. For the last hour or so, he sat quietly, his brows knitted in concentration, staring at the nut through the glass window. In the silence that follows Lime's ultimatum, he speaks up. Is it really so necessary that we take the nut? Or... 
Would it be enough to disable it? That would be a step in the right direction, says Beatty. What do you have in mind? Think of it as a wild dog den, Gail continues. You're not going to fight your way in, so you have two choices. Trap the dogs inside or flush them out. We've tried bombing the entrances, says Lime. They're set too far inside the stone for any real damage to be done. I wasn't thinking of that, says Gale. I was thinking of using the mountain. Beatty rises and joins Gale at the window, peering through his ill-fitting glasses. See? Running down the sides. Avalanche path, says Beatty under his breath. It'd be tricky. Oh, we'd have to design the detonation sequence with great care, and once it's in motion, we couldn't hope to control it. We don't need to control it if we give up the idea that we have to possess the nut, says Gale. Only shut it down. So you're suggesting we start avalanches and block the entrances, asks Slime. That's it, says Gale. Trap the enemy inside, cut off from supplies. Make it impossible for them to send out their hovercraft. While everyone considers the plan, Boggs flips through a stack of blueprints of the nut and frowns. You risk killing everyone inside. Look at the ventilation system. It's rudimentary at best, nothing like what we have in 13. It depends entirely on pumping in air from the mountainsides. Block those vents and you'll suffocate whoever is trapped. They could still escape through the train tunnel to the square, says Beatty. Not if we blow it up, says Gale brusquely. His intent, his full intent, becomes clear. Gale has no interest in preserving the lives of those in the nut. No interest in caging the prey for later use. This is one of his death traps. And that ends chapter 14. Catch us back next time for chapter 15.